Welcome to the Clayton Tyner Podcast, where I help you view current issues through the lens of the ancient wisdom of Scripture. This week, we get honest about the United States military readiness. Morale is low, recruitment is low, and possibly most indicative of the problem, our strategic petroleum reserve is drastically low. With two major wars now getting the United States' attention, it's high time we diagnose our issues internally. Speaking of threats to humanity, a trend has emerged where elite billionaires feel comfortable publicly talking talking about the need for human depopulation. So is population growth a threat to humanity? And how do we think about God's view on this situation? Michael Gunger was a worship leader turned Christian music star turned church planner. Then he abandoned his faith and became an atheist for a time. The latest is that Gunger is some kind of progressive spiritualist. Last week, he went viral with some of his thoughts on faith and the church. We'll break those down and see if they hold up under scrutiny. All that and one look at the spiritual transformation of famous tattoo artist Kat Von D. Having spent her adult life dabbling in the occult, she has now converted to Christianity and was even publicly baptized. So what was it that opened her eyes to the truth? And what does this teach us about the spiritual battle that we are all a part of? Let's find out together on episode 35 of the Clayton Tyner podcast. episode 35. I am so glad that you guys joined us. Uh, I want to thank everyone who has continued rocking with the podcast. You're sharing it on your social media. You're lighting up the comments. Everyone who has subscribed, if you're new to the channel, be sure to subscribe and turn on that notification bell so you keep up with our content. You can also follow me at Clayton Tyner. That's Clayton, T-Y-N-E-R. I'm on Instagram and I'm on Twitter. It's another way to keep up with the show. And if you want to know what my real job is. I'm the lead pastor of Meta Church. You can check out what we do at youtube.com slash Meta Church. Here on the Clayton Tyner podcast, we try to look at current real issues going on around us through the ancient lens of the wisdom of scripture. And it helps us to form nuanced thoughts to not be just like drawn into the very divided talking points that the culture falls into and shouts over each other. Instead, we try to approach things with wisdom. And not only does this give us a more respectable and powerful position with our thoughts, um, It also just helps us be better witnesses uh, for the faith that we do have. We've got some important points to get to today. So without further ado, let's get to our three points. The U.S. military has missed on its recruitment numbers for multiple years in a row. Patriotism is at an all-time low, and even the strategic oil reserves have been depleted for political purposes. Were the United States to be drawn into a war today, we would be in the worst position culturally that we have seen maybe in our history. So how did we get here and how can we course correct? And this is going to largely be about leadership. I want to look at some of the reporting on the state of the military right now. Uh, This is from PBS, why recruiting and confidence in America's armed forces is so low right now. It says the all volunteer military has reached crisis levels of low recruitment, crisis levels of low recruitment, while at the same time, the American public's perception of the armed forces is increasingly divided. A recent Gallup poll found confidence in the U.S. military is at its lowest level in over two decades. Only 60 percent of people told Gallup they had confidence in the U.S. military. This is supposed to be the premier fighting force on the entire planet. No one is supposed to be even close to the U.S. and only 60 percent of people believe in it. At the same time, some military branches are falling short of their yearly recruiting goals by the thousands. The Army is set to fall 15,000 recruits short this year. So we are in some real difficulty just with the morale, people not wanting to enter into the military in the first place. A lot of that, I believe, is tied to a lack of patriotism, people questioning the entire American experience. We have a very like Marxist ideology that is once again propagating throughout the country that's all about the oppressed and the oppressors. And since America is the most affluent country on earth, the freest country on earth, it is seen as the ultimate oppressor. We're colonizers. We're maybe not even worth uh, defending in the first place. And so recruitment is low and morale is low. And I might just be picking on this, but I think that one of the key indicators of just how, how 
poorly prepared we are. And I think this is a good indicator because it speaks directly to the heart of leadership decisions that are putting us in these types of difficult positions is where we're at with the strategic petroleum reserve. Uh, let's read about that. It says strategic petroleum reserve near historic lows as war breaks out in the Middle East. The Biden administration's drawdowns of the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, which serves as America's energy stockpile of petroleum and high market prices delaying efforts to replenish it, have left the reserve near its lowest level since 1983, at the same time that war in the Middle East could destabilize global oil su supplies. Data from the Energy Information Administration, the EIA, indicates that the Strategic Petroleum Reserve has about 351 million barrels of oil stockpiled, a slight increase from the low of 346 in July and August. The last time that it was at or below 350 million barrels for an extended period of time was the fall of 1983 when it was still in the process of being filled. In other words, it's never been this low. I mean, back in 1983, we were just in the process of starting to fill it up. Since it's past that, it's never gotten back down to there before. And herein lies the problem as I see it. The problem is that we have taken something, the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, which is meant for something just like we're seeing right now over in the Middle East, potential, potential destabilization that would lead to a massive crisis in the oil supply chain. And so we, we made a decision as a country a long, long time ago to stock up on this emergency for strategic use only. Now, it was used strategically, but that strategic in the petroleum reserve is not for political strategy. Wow. It's supposed to be used for things like war, for things like crisis, to make sure that we have some level of internal energy independence. Um, this is a national security issue. And the reason that we drained it was primarily for political cause. Now, it was a smart strategy. Prices on everything, inflation has been out of control. Uh, it finally has been curved, but even now in 2023, we're we're still aware of what things were two and three years ago. And so they say, you know, inflation's only at 4%, but we're buying a $4 carton of eggs. And we remember buying a $1 carton of eggs. And so the, the, the inflation rate is based off year over year. So yes, it's not as high as it was last year, but for the two years preceding that, it had skyrocketed. So we're now at a much elevated place from where we were a couple of years ago. And gas prices, as you remember in 2022, were soaring and they're kind of taking off again, unfortunately. And that looks really bad for midterm elections. And so we started releasing millions and millions and millions of barrels from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve to artificially lower gas prices so that the party in power didn't take the hit at the ballot box. And it's a good political strategy, but you don't use national security means for political strategy. Um, and now we're going to pay for it. And that's always what happens. Proper sacrifice today protects you in your future. Improper sacrifice today will haunt you in your future. And so listen, if the situations that you find yourself in leadership, some of them are your, your fault, some of them are not, if the policies that you put into place have immediate or even long-term effect that does inflate prices, as a leader, you have to live in the reality of that situation. You have to make proper sacrifices today. And a proper sacrifice when prices are out of control might mean just going up and humbly owning what's going on and talking to the people that you lead, which if you're the president is everybody, and explaining what's going on, but you don't take the shortcut and artificially lower prices to try and boost your political means because every benefit has a cost and improper sacrifice has great cost always. And the way that this tends to work is when we are willing to stand our ground and take our consequences, then we position ourselves well for the future, even if in the short term, we take some lumps for it. Not sacrificing is not an option. You will sacrifice something. And if you're not willing to sacrifice today, then what you're doing is you are sacrificing yourself 
in the future. There's a, a great story in scripture that has this incredible leadership lesson inside of it. It's in Genesis chapter 41. It's a story of Joseph, who is a dream interpreter. It says, so Pharaoh said to Joseph, in my dream, I was standing on the bank of the Nile when seven well-fed, healthy looking cows came up from the Nile and grazed among the reeds. And after them, seven other cows, weak, very sick and thin came up. I've never seen such sickly ones in all the land of Egypt. Then the thin sickly cows ate the first seven well-fed cows. And when they had devoured them, you could not tell they had devoured them. Their appearance was as bad as it had been before. And I woke up. And in my dream, I also saw seven heads of grain full and good coming up on one stalk. And after them, seven heads of grain withered thin and scorched by the east wind sprouted up. And the thin heads of grain swallowed the seven good ones. And I told this to the magicians, but no one can tell me what it means. And Joseph said to Pharaoh, Pharaoh's dreams mean the same thing. God has revealed to Pharaoh what he's about to do. The seven good cows are seven years and the seven good heads are seven years. And the dream means the same thing. The seven thin sickly cows that came up after them are seven years and the seven worthless are also seven years of famine. It's just as I told Pharaoh, God has shown Pharaoh what he's about to do. Seven years of great abundance are coming. And after them, seven years of famine will take place and all the abundance in the land of Egypt will be forgotten and the famine will devastate the land. So now, now here's the prescription that, that Joseph gives him. Pharaoh, look for a discerning and wise man, man and set him over the land of Egypt and let Pharaoh do this. Let him appoint overseers over the land and take a fifth of the harvest of the land of Egypt during the seven years and gather all the excess food during these good years that are coming. And under Pharaoh's authority, store the grain in the cities so they may preserve it as food. And the food will be a strategic reserve for the land during the seven years of famine that will take place. And then the country will not be wiped out by famine. Famine is always coming in some way, shape or form. Disaster is always coming in some way, shape or, or form. If you're going to lead at any kind of a high level, you can be certain of this. You will bear immense weight on behalf of the people that you serve. And had the Pharaoh gone through the first five years and put together this strategic grain reserve because he knew famine is coming, but things got out of hand and maybe he lost some popularity. And so he just started handing out free grain. You know what? We've got free grain. Let me give some out that will establish goodwill. My popularity, my Gallup poll will start going back wow. up. L let me just take out of this. But you know, famine's coming. And you can look at 3,000 years of war in the Middle East and know where we get our oil from. We're no longer energy independent. Where we get our oil from. There's no stability. Bad things are coming. And so when you drain your strategic reserves for political means to boost your polls, to win a few odd Senate seats or congressional seats, what you're doing is you are sacrificing your future self on the altar of immediate gratification. Here's what King Solomon said in the Proverbs. He said, look at the ant and consider its ways and be wise. It has no commander, no overseer or ruler, and yet it stores its provisions in summer and gathers its food at harvest. Even the ant knows how to set aside strategic reserve. We have like all-time low everything, all-time low patriotism, all-time low recruiting numbers, all-time low military morale, all-time all low strategic oil reserves. And part of the reason that all of this is so low is because we have leaders who aren't willing to address reality. Here's what's actually happening. Here's where we're actually at. Here's the real state of things. We have leaders who are incentivized in every direction to never admit a fault, to never say that they were wrong, to never humble themselves, to just stick to talking points and entrenched ideologies instead of speaking to the American people about the nuance of how the world and reality in our country actually operates. To really lead people, you must be a leader that addresses reality. This is what Jesus did. He walked into the scene where everything was cloaked largely by religion and power structures, and he just started speaking truth. And everything he said was true. And everything he said addressed reality. And at the same time that we have almost no one in leadership of our country who will speak about what's really going on in front of us, we also as people have become so cynical. Our BS meters are on like level 10,000. And so we can't actually be fooled. We see it and it just grows 
anger. And we don't know exactly what's real, but we know that there's so much corruption and we know that no one's actually telling us the truth. And so our morale continues to plummet and our patriotism continues to plummet. And people don't want to sign up to potentially risk their lives for a country that is run by people who make selfish, selfish decisions and never tell the truth. If you want to be someone who is a great leader, you must be a leader that always addresses reality. The depopulation movement continues to grow as we become convinced that humans are the root cause of every bad thing on planet Earth. When billionaires like Bill Gates talk openly about death panels and human extinction movements begin gaining ground, we should probably stop and look at both the data and the history of population growth. More than that, there is a dark ideology undergirding these ideas that must be brought into the light. We're going to get a little bit technical on this conversation. I think it's important because this is something that is gaining ground and it's gaining ground quickly. And the more that the cultural religion of the West becomes climate, worshiping climate, whatever that even means, we can't, good luck even defining what climate exactly is or what it means to the person next to you. But we worship climate, we worship the earth, we worship Mother Gaia, we've reverted back to these pagan ideas that we, we just give deference to the, the sun, moon, and stars and the trees and the grass and the animals all around us. Many people are beginning to see human beings as the actual cancer on the earth. We are the plague. We are the problem. And we have seen over the years, even very influential people just get very specific about the decisions of, you know, how long people should live or how many kids someone should actually have. We're going to look at a, a few examples of this. This is Bill Gates from about 10 years ago. That's a trade-off society is making because of very, very high medical costs and a lack of willingness to say, you know, is spending a million dollars on that last three months of life for that patient, would it be better not to lay off the, those 10 teachers and to make that trade-off in medical costs? But that's called the death panel uh, and you're not supposed to have that discussion. Yeah, that's called the death panel and you're not supposed to have that. We're not supposed to talk about when someone's not dead, whether or not we should kill them. <laughs> And if you're wondering, he's going to go ahead and explain it a little bit further. So you, of course, well, that's making... an interesting thing you just said, which is just the last three months in life for one person or something, because we haven't had a discussion of how to allocate that money. It means we lay off three teachers to do so. I mean, in other words, we that's haven't right. had Society's this type of making, allocation. We're discussion. making that trade off because of huge medical costs that are not examined to see which ones actually have no benefit whatsoever. Well, wait, and because of pension generosity, we will be laying off over 100,000 teachers. So no benefit whatsoever. So your, your grandma or your grandpa is in the hospital and they're 80 years old and they have six more months to live and there's no benefit whatsoever, according to Bill Gates, to keeping them alive. And you gotta understand, one of the things that he's doing here is he's talking about issues of life and issues of liberty and issues of the pursuit of happiness. Is education important? Yes. Do we want teachers to be laid off? No. Also, Bill Gates has enough money to employ probably all of the teachers in his state or half of the country for like multiple years in a row, right? So he's saying we have to have death panels and we've got to look at people who are sick or infirm or have, you know, incurable diseases or don't have a high quality of life. Um, this is the same conversation that has led historically to conversations about eugenics, where someone is born with a psychological condition or a mental impairment or, or, or all host of other reasons. They're born into poverty. And so you just very carefully get rid of the undesirables so that the rest of us, you know, can stay employed and life is the foundational right that all the other rights rest on. And so like the right to liberty, like you have the liberty to pursue whatever career you want, the, the right as you know ex explicated in our, our founding documents to pursue happiness, right? You're much happier being employed than unemployed. Th that is a right that rests on the foundation of life. And if we begin to remove the, the God-given, divinely mandated right to, to light, like, well, it, it says, we hold these truths to be self-evident. Benjamin Franklin changed that. Thomas Jefferson wanted to say that they were divinely uh, originated. We have the right to life. And he's saying, well, let's call that into question. And you're, you're comparing whether or not some people, which 
it's like we're we're problem solvers, you know. Surely we can come together and figure out how to keep these teachers employed and not start killing people because we want to play God in some way. Now, coincidentally, maybe this next clip is from Melinda Gates, who is Bill Gates' wife, and this is part of a, a 60 Minutes interview. And we're not going to play all of it because what I actually want you to hear is not from her. It's from the person interviewing her. We were at one of these meetings yesterday. And I remember that a lady told you that she had had eight children mm -hmm. and four of them had died in childbirth mm -hmm. or shortly thereafter. But if all of them had survived, she'd have eight children. Mm -hmm. And what the developing world does not need is more children. Wow. What the developing world does not need is more children. Number one, this is like the most paternalistic thing I've ever heard anyone say, maybe ever. Also, as they're walking through a third world country, uh, these two white people surrounded by people of color saying, hey, the last thing these people need is to have more kids. It's kind of racist. So the clip just goes on like that's assumed. Well, we all know this, you know, all, all of us just elite Western brilliant minds. I mean, it goes without saying, he's just begging the question. It goes without saying what we don't want is for these people in a developed world to be having lots and lots of kids. I mean, how, how terrible would that be? I mean, I know scripture calls like kids that the greatest blessing and the, like the, the jewels in our crowns. And like, I know that, but oh, how terrible would it be for them to have lots of kids, like lots of kids to help them around the house and to hit a certain age where they can bring in more income and to help take care of their other siblings so the parents can go out and, and find jobs. Oh, it'd be terrible for them to have so many kids now in the West. You know, I mean, if we want to have four or five kids and, you know, then we just kind of nepotistically hand them millions of dollars and take over the business. I mean, that, that's good for us, you know, because we live on multi-acre lots. We have plenty of room. You know, we don't hurt for anything. But these poor people, oh, boy, the last thing we want is them having. So this goes to its logical extreme when people start talking about how humans are the scourge on the earth. And just one of these that The New York Times uh, talked about lately, this is an article from the CBC, is a, a group called uh, Vehemnent, the case against humans. Um, it says, thank you for not breeding. What do humans do for the earth's biosphere that isn't about humans? That's the question last night, spokesman, for the whimsically titled Voluntary Human Extinction Movement wants you to answer. Now, you're gonna think almost immediately that this is kind of like just an overstatement. They, it's hyperbolic to get your attention. They don't actually want humans to go extinct. They probably just want less people to have kids so that we don't overpopulate, so there's enough resources for everyone. And if that's what you're thinking, you are wrong. He says, when we post stories and features about the environment, climate change, resource depletion, and the like, readers sometimes comment that the real issue is people, too many people. And indeed, if our current numbers are causing problems to humans and nature alike, what will the population the United Nations projects for the year 2050 do to the planet? And so one of our commenting readers pointed us to vehement. So their readers are writing and saying, people are the problem. We got to get rid of having so many people. Now, there's no members in this group. You express interest by logging into a forum. The intentionally childless leader, Les Knight, believes there are several million volunteers around the world, although few would have heard of them. To be a volunteer means deciding not to have children, but not to avoid messy diapers or runny noses. He says, he hit me first at 5 a.m. since the local, local hockey arena. Okay, I, I, I messed it up. For these believers, it's a decision for the planet, for species that aren't human, for frogs and lowland gorillas, polar bears, and albatrosses. As one forum poster wrote, the worst environmental cr crime any individual can commit is making more people. And so they have this quote, live long and die. Live long and die childless, right? And so I, I just wanna scroll down. It says, this sounds, so here's the CBC, they go, that sounds as if you're saying we don't actually have to go extinct. You know, we just need to have less children and, and make sure that we leave a better world behind us. And here's what he says. No, we do. We do need to go extinct because as long as there is one breeding couple of homo sapiens, we will be right back where we are now. We are just incredibly fecund. Um, we are the problem. We are the issue. And so the only chance for the earth to survive and to thrive 
is for humans to stop existing. Now, if humans stop existing, there is no longer any consciousness on earth. And as far as we know, there's no consciousness left in the universe. And if there is no consciousness left on earth, it is the same thing as there being no earth. Wow. And I will stand by that. And what this actually is, depopulation, this whole narrative, depopulation is the counterfeit to the creation narrative. God says, be fruitful and multiply. Satan says, live long and die out. Depopulation is the counterfeit to the creation narrative. And let me remind you, um, the creative mandate given from God to his imagers, which is us, God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. All of those matter. Be fruitful, multiply, have lots of kids, fill the earth and subdue it. You might remember the story of the Tower of Babel, where, where instead of filling the earth, they said, let's stay in one place and let's build a skyscraper and we can all just live here. And we all kind of like each other and we can advance our technology and we don't have to go to the ends of the earth. The reason that the Tower of Babel was a sin is because it was disobeying the creative mandate to fill the earth, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, and subdue the earth. And what has happened throughout time is as we have obeyed that, God, who is in control of our world, has blessed us through it. Uh, I want to look at some actual data. Um, this is our world in data. That's the website. It says, does population growth lead to hunger and famine? Um, it's not uncommon to see arguments along the lines of this quote from Sir Jonathan Porritt claiming that famines are ultimately caused by overpopulation. Porritt, who's the former director of Friends of the Earth and also former chairman of the UK government's Sustainable Development Commission, was talking about the 2011 famine in Somalia that went on to kill roughly 250,000 people. He seems certain that the rapid population growth witnessed in e East Africa had made famine there unavoidable. Now, this goes back all the way, they point out, to a Malthusian belief. Looking at the world as a whole, it's very difficult to square Malthus' hypothesis with the simple but stark fact that despite the world's population increasing from less than 1 billion in 1800 to more than 7 billion today, the number of people dying due to famine in recent decades is only a tiny fraction of that in previous errors. Uh, Robert Thomas Robert Malthus, the English political economist, writing at the turn of the 19th century, he asserted that in the absence of preventative checks to reduce birth rates, the natural tendency for population to increase, being so superior to the power of the earth to produce substance for man, ultimately results in positive checks that increase the death rate. If all else fails to curb population, gigantic inevitable famine stalks in the rear and with one mighty blow levels the population with the food of the world. This was Malthus' idea all the way back in 1900. This has been adopted. This is the Bill Gates and Melinda Gates approach. This is Les Knight's call for the extinction of the human race. This is so many other influential figures and billionaires and elites who are calling for depopulation because overpopulation is going to end the world. And so here's some of the history that you need to know. People have been saying this forever. So back in 1800, there were less than a billion people. And all the way back then, people are saying, with the population increasing, man, we're just going to run out of food. We're going to run out of resources. We're going to run out of oxygen. People have been saying this forever. There's a famous case uh, of this. It was between two guys, one named Julian Simon and one named Paul Ehrlich. And uh, Paul Paul Ehrlich, or Ehrlich, he wrote a book called The Population Bomb. And in The Population Bomb, he said that over the next 10 to 20 years, you are going to see people die by the millions and millions and millions. Hundreds of millions of people are going to be wiped off the earth in 1980. He said England will not exist by the year 2000 because the population is growing too fast. And because the population is growing too fast, there's not going to be enough food and water. We're not going to be able to sustain it. And Julian Simon, who, who was a, a business person, he bet him and he said... I, 
not only are you wrong, but I'll actually put money on this. Here's the Wikipedia article about this famous bet. In 1968, Ehrlich published the population bomb, which argued that mankind was facing a demographic catastrophe with the rate of population growth quickly outstripping growth in the supply of food and resources. Simon was highly skeptical of such claims, so proposed a wager telling Ehrlich to select any raw material he wanted and select any date more than a year away. And Simon would bet that the commodities price on that date would be lower than what it was at the time of the wager. Ehrlich and his colleagues picked five metals that they thought would undergo big price increases, chronium, copper, nickel, tin, and tungsten. Then on paper, they bought $200 worth of each for a total bet of $1,000 using the prices on September 29th, 1980 as an index. They designated the same day in 1990, 10 years later as the payoff date. If the inflation-adjusted prices of the various metals rose, Simon would lose and pay Ehrlich. And if the prices fell, Ehrlich would pay Simon. And between 1980 and 1990, the world's population grew by more than 800 million, the largest increase in one decade ever. But 10 years later, the price of every one of the selected metals had fallen, every one of them. And the reason that they did this where they, they picked the, the different metals and they looked at them and they saw the prices and the adjustment on them is – they wanted to know as more and more and more people come, are all of the raw materials going to become so depleted that they skyrocket in price and the exact opposite happened. And it happens for numerous reasons. Number one, innovation outstrips our population growth and innovation isn't some just ethereal thing. Innovation comes from the people. The more people you have, the more potential pockets of innovation exist in the soul of every human being. And as Christians, we believe that we are imagers of the divine. I mean, if last night got his way and there were no more humans on earth, there, there would be no Im image, imagers of God on earth. God's not going to allow that to happen. He told us to be fruitful and multiply. As we continue to do that, he will be faithful to sustain us. And we see that in some of the data. We can look at some of the charts back on ourworldindata.com. This is famine victims worldwide since the 1860s. And you can see that the population, as represented by this red line, just skyrocketed starting around the 1960s. At the same time, worldwide victims of famines fell off of a cliff due to innovation. We see the daily supply of calories per person from 1961 to 2018. Of course, there was massive, massive population growth by billions of people. And everyone everywhere now gets a more daily supply of cal calories per person. Uh, we see the deaths from malnutrition by age from 1990 to 2019. Remember, it, it was just 1980 where Paul Ehrlich was saying that England wouldn't even exist. Hundreds of millions of people were going to die. But in fact, deaths from malnutrition have absolutely fallen off of a cliff. And people utilize fear. They love fear. Depopulation is the counterfeit to the creation narrative. God says, be fruitful and multiply. Satan says, live long and die out. Here Here's what is written about Satan in Revelation. The great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. That is his job, to st steal and kill and destroy. And the greatest thing he uses is deception and fear. And the overpopulation myth is just that. It is a myth. And in fact, many places in the West, the actual, the actual issue is depopulation because many places in the West are not at or above replacement rate of their own populations. So be very careful when people come in with these big stories about uh, all, all the overpopulation, all the dangers to all of us. Our first position is to trust God. And God said, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Michael Gunger was once a famous worship artist before abandoning his faith and claiming the title atheist for a season. More recently, Gunger has discovered some form of universalism and progressive theology. Last week, he posted a couple of videos looking for a church that would accept and even involve him, even though he denies their orthodox beliefs. He later clarified his beliefs in a video that we will look at today. We're going to take a look at both of Gunger's videos. I want to say a few things first. Um, when I was a full-time musician, I got to spend a little bit of time with Michael and Lisa Gunger right after Beautiful Things came out. And if you know their discography, that really was the album that put Gunger, the band, 
on the map. Uh, we got to hang out with them. We got to see him live. Uh, amazing work. I have loved, loved their music in the past. He's a very interesting guy. He's very, very intelligent guy. Uh, at least that's how he comes across. And he's been on quite the journey and where he's landed um, is not what I believe at all. And we're going to see that pretty clearly. I was very interested in these videos that he posted. And so we'll respond to those today. Here's the first one that he put out. It says, here's a video I didn't ever expect to make. And we will find the volume. I am church shopping. For those of you who just have followed me recently, or maybe you haven't known my whole story, here's a quick recap. I was raised a pastor's kid, worship leader. I began to tour the world as a worship leader, got awards and, and recognition for that. And then I very publicly sort of deconstructed my faith, my beliefs anyway, and uh, became a bit of a black sheep in that music industry. For a long time, I stayed away from all things Christian, and then I began to, after a lot of searching through different religions and traditions and practices, began to rediscover aspects of my own upbringing that I loved. And now I've kind of come full circle, where I actually find a lot of beauty in a tradition that surrenders oneself to God. And I'm looking for a group of people that have enough spaciousness to allow someone like me who doesn't necessarily believe in the exclusivity of any one religion but is open to god everywhere ideally i'd love to find a place where i can not just go but get involved in some way musically or i don't know but i live in pasadena so if you know anywhere that might be open to heretics like me let me know so that was uh, tongue in cheek there at, at the end. Anyone who might be open to, you know, wink, wink, heretics like me. And it's very interesting what he's asking for. He goes through a little bit of a story. I abandoned the faith and then I looked at all kinds of religious practices. And I, I really want a church that's open to me. And, and I would hope that like anywhere would be open to him coming and, and wrestling and, and listening and sitting under teaching and everything. Um, here's, here's what can be kind of dangerous is he's saying, I like aspects of the tradition of Christianity. And so I want to come and involve myself in a church, but uh, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not there to learn. Um, I need you to be open to what I already believe. And so I'm, you know, I'm gonna sit under your teaching that if, if it's a church should be coming out of scripture, um, but I already know what I believe about that scripture. And you've gotta be open to a heretic like me. And he says it tongue in cheek, and I think it's a bit of a coping mechanism because as we're about to find out, he does deny the exclusivity of Christ, which does make him a heretic. I mean, by definition in the church world, that is heretical. Um, the primary issues of the faith mostly revolve around Jesus and who he is and what he represents to us. And he's been in the church world for a very long time. He was a, a worship leader at a big mega church, I think in Michigan or somewhere like that. And he knows what he's asking for. He's saying, I want to come. I don't believe the Orthodox beliefs of the church, um, but I don't just want to come. I want to be involved. I want to be a part of the ministry, even though I don't hold to the beliefs of the ministry. And that's asking for a lot. Um, that's asking to be in some position of, of leadership over this thing when you don't actually hold to what the thing holds. And I think it also just is a misrepresentation of what church actually is. Church is the body of believers. It's the bride of Christ. It's those who are in Christ through faith in him who are looking to submit their lives to Jesus and follow solely after him. Church isn't just a building or an organization or a Sunday service that you play guitar in. That's the gathering of the church. And the church, it isn't it's not a buffet line where you can pick and choose the parts of it that you want. It's like an organism that you belong to or not. Paul says it's a body and everyone has a role that they play in the body. And when one part of the body is hurt, the whole body is hurt. And when one party is doing good, the whole body rejoices. And so he got a, a lot of attention on this, specifically with one thing that he said about the exclusivity of any one given religion. And so then he posted another video explaining his position there. No one comes to the Father but through me. And what I thought that meant was that there was like a bunch of options, right? Like a grab bag. We're gonna have a bottle, a bunch of these bottles of water, okay? 
and you had to make sure you had the right one. So all these different kinds of bottles, possibly you know, Buddha or Muhammad or Krishna or whatever, you had all these different kinds of options. There was one bottle in particular that was the right one. Through time though, I discovered that that view had some limitations to it. There were some issues that came up. For instance, if my God was just one bottle among lots of bottles, one God amongst lots of gods, isn't that kind of a small God? All right, if my God, so, so he goes into uh, analogy, right? And he's going to use props. Now, let me tell you something. Uh, I cannot play the guitar like Michael Gunger. He's one of the best guitar players I've literally ever seen. I can't sing like Michael Gunger. Uh, I, I can't write songs like Michael Gunger. But if he thinks he's better than me at props. Stop the cap. No, no, no. No, sir. I brought props. He said, he said, what if God is all of these water bottles, a grab bag, and you have Muhammad and you, you have uh, Vishnu and you have uh the god of mormonism and then one of these bottles out of all of them is jesus um here's the problem with this as an analogy is he's starting by begging the question and begging the question means you have assumed the answer before you've made the argument to instantiate the belief that you're starting with and so he's starting with the idea that there are, in fact, many different gods. And out of these many gods, it's our job to pick the one perfect God. And if that's true, that our God is just one of many gods, and they all have the same veracity, and they're all true, and they all lead to some kind of eternal life, then he says that that's not like the big, omnipotent, infinite God that I thought I was supposed to believe in. And He's starting by saying, this is true. There's a grab bag full of water bottle gods. But he's starting with the conclusion. And it's a conclusion that Christianity doesn't agree with. And that makes it a straw man argument. He's arguing against Christianity with a starting presupposition that no Christian in the world would agree with. That God is one God among all the other options that could be God. The problem with this is you can't take the words of Jesus and interpret them through the lens of your own analogy. That's what cults do. They, they take the scripture and then they say, well, you know, Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the father except through me. And so he's the one way, right? So now I'm going to create an analogy. He's, he's the only one way. He, he's one of these gods. There's all these other gods and I've got to parse through all of them. And what if I live on the wrong side of the world and, and I pick the, the Buddha bottle, you know? And so now, I, man, I'm just screwed because I, I picked the wrong God and there's all these gods. And that doesn't seem like a, a big, infinite God. It seems like a, a really small God. But what did Jesus actually claim? Did he claim exclusivity? Like when he says, I am the way and the truth and the life. When he says in, in Acts, and there's salvation in no one else, for there's no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. There's no one else. Or in 1 Timothy, where it says, for there is one God and there's one mediator between God and man and men, the man, Christ Jesus. Or in Romans, when it says, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, not Muhammad, not Buddha, and believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, then and only then will you be saved. You can't interpret the words of Jesus through some analogy that you came up with because you happen to have some water bottles sitting next to you. You have to start with the understanding of the plain words of Jesus and then go from there if you want to create an analogy. This is what cults do. Right now, there's a very popular cult called the World Mission Society Church of God. I could have picked a shorter name. But they have this analogy that they say, because there's a father God, there has to be a mother God. That's where they start. They believe in mother God. They worship mother God. And the way that they find that in scripture, literally, they will take you to the, the Lord's prayer, the model prayer, which says, our father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. And they'll say that's a proof text for mother God, because if there's a father, there has to be a mother. So they are starting with an analogy and then taking their analogy they came up with in their own mind 
and using it to try and understand scripture. And that's all he's doing. And it's clever and it's, it's maybe interesting, um, but it's a straw man and it's begging the question and, and it's an unhelpful thought process and it proves nothing about the exclusivity of Christ. All right, we will let him continue. I thought God was supposed to be infinite. Secondly, what about the people who accidentally picked the wrong bottle? Are they really deserving of hell because they tried to find water somewhere else? If we think of this water bottle as Jesus, and we hear it saying, I am the water that will quench your thirst, the one water. Well, what if we mistook the bottle for the water? What if that's what idolatry is? What if in this bottle, the water was speaking? Okay, so um, is that what idolatry is as defined by scripture or really any religion. No, no, it, it, it's, it's just not. And so I'm, I'm not going to broach that subject. Um, is Jesus a water bottle? No, N no. And it's not really helpful of an analogy because you started with your analogy and then went to scripture. He did something else very interesting. And I do want to actually get to his question about what about people who picked the wrong bottle? Now I'm going to have to go with his analogy, even though it's a broken and silly analogy, but what about people who've never heard of Jesus and they live on the other side of the world? Are they really deserving of help? I'll broach that subject in a second. First, I just want to point out the very quick sleight of hand that he did. He started his video by quoting from John 14. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. At the end of the video, he conflated that with a story out of John 4, where Jesus is at Jacob's well with the woman from Samaria, and he asks her to draw water, and she says, why are you talking to me? You're a Jewish man. I'm a Samaritan woman. And he says, if you knew who asked, then you would give him, and I would give you everlasting water, that would spring up in you into a well of eternal life. And Jesus uses the well as this object lesson and refers to eternal life, salvation, um, as this living water. And so he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me, an exclusive claim. He conflates that with a, an offer in a very specific scenario with Jacob's well to say, but what if the exclusive offer is actually the water inside? And it's not really the bottle at all. Wow. It's just silly and it's a twisting of words and it's not helpful and it's not a good argument at all. It's like, you know, what about marriage? You know, you could just do that. You could do that with, if you wanted an open marriage, you know, you could say, look, you have two water bottles, husband and wife, you know, and then together you have a marriage. But what if the, what if the marriage isn't the bottles? What if it's the water? And if it's the water bringing more water into our marriage, even though it's another bottle, more water, more marriage, therefore polygamy. And you know what? I'm going to read all the text in scripture and say marriage isn't about the bottles, the people. It's about the water. It's the idea inside. And so the more the marriage. So guess what? We're going to have a lot of wives. It's just so bad. And yet, it tricks people and it sounds really smart and it sounds intelligent and people want universalism to be true. And yet universalism is about as disrespectful to every major religion. And of course I'm convinced that not only is Christianity the, the one true path to God, and as I've said many times on almost every episode, Christianity is not just another one of the world's religions. It breaks every mold of religion that is out there. It's not about you having to climb the ladder and work your way to God. It's about God coming down to us and living in our brokenness. It's not about us dying to, to get to God. It's about God dying so that we could be in relationship with him. It's a complete reversal of the religious narrative. But at the same time, world religions make exclusive claims. Um, Buddhism, properly understood, doesn't have the idea of an afterlife like Islam or Christianity does. Um, a lot of the Eastern religions, Hinduism has reincarnation. It's completely incompatible with the ideas of Islam. Uh, the, the God of Islam completely rejects Jesus Christ, who is the only way to God in Christianity. These are mutually exclusive things. They can't just all be true. It can't just be all the water that leads to the same place because the religions themselves don't even lead to the same place as they explicate in their own religious texts. And the, the whole thing is just backwards, but he asks a question that is kind of the got you question. What about those who have never heard? 
What about those who pick the wrong bottle? They pick the Muhammad bottle. They pick the, the Buddha bottle. And scripture speaks to this, I think, rather clearly. In Romans 1, Paul is, is writing to uh, a church full of Jewish and Gentile believers. He says, for God's invisible attributes, that is his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly seen since the creation of the world, being understood through what he has made. What he's saying is all of creation testifies in this general revelation of who God is. And he says in, the, in that verse, as a result, here's the result of God speaking through his creation. All people are without excuse. We do not have an excuse for seeking after the one true God. And that's true for all people in all places. Then in the next chapter in Romans chapter two, he says, so when Gentiles who do not by nature have the law, that's the Jewish law that revealed God to the Jewish people. When they do what the law demands, they are a law to themselves, even though they don't have the law. They show that the works of the law is written on their hearts. That's the general revelation. We're, we're all without excuse. Their consciences confirm this. Their competing thoughts either excuse them or, or either accuse them or excuse them. And on the day when God judges what people have kept secret, according to my gospel through Christ Jesus, there is an idea that even Jesus shows time and again in scripture that we will be judged based on the knowledge that we have. Do we understand perfectly how that works? We don't. Do we understand perfectly how judgment works at the end? We don't. This is what Jesus said to the Pharisees. Some of the Pharisees who were with him heard these things and said, we aren't blind too, are we? And Jesus told them, if you were blind, you wouldn't have sin. But now that you say, we see your sin remains. He's, he's directly equating their knowledge of the law and their knowledge of God with their culpability for their sin. Paul says, everyone has seen God's invisible attributes. Everyone can cry out to God. Everyone can see creation around them and grope for the things of God. And God is faithful as we respond to the revelation we're given to give more revelation and God who is just will judge fairly at the end. We will be judged by how we respond to the light that we are given. And Jesus followers, our call is to go to the ends of the earth with the gospel, which means we're called to bring the direct light of Jesus all the way to the ends of the earth. So now let's get to our last segment. Kat Von D is a world famous tattoo artist and reality television actress. Her style is unmistakable, black, muted, and gothic, which is why fans were stunned when she showed up on Instagram in a pure white gown preparing for her baptism in a traditional church. The gothic trendsetter acknowledged that she was throwing out all of her books and objects tied to the occult and witchcraft, and she has now surrendered her life to Jesus. So what caused this massive change? And is there a chance that the world is ready for a spiritual awakening? Awakening. I want to look at this article out of Relevant Magazine about the transformation in Kat Von D's life. It says, Kat Von D gets baptized after renouncing the occult. Kat Von D is undergoing a spiritual transformation. The renowned tattoo artist, TV personality, and makeup mogul is embracing Christianity and sharing her journey through social media. This week, Kat Von D opened up about her recent baptism on her Instagram account that has 9 million followers, quite the platform. The video captures the essence of her baptism ceremony where close friends and family were gathered in a church as witnesses. Her husband of five years commented his support and love. I love you so much, my beautiful wife. You continue to inspire me every day. I wanna marry you over and over again. Her spiritual transformation has has been a long time coming. In July of 2022, she posted on Instagram that she was moving away from dabbling in occult practices, witchcraft, and tarot. I've always found beauty in the macabre, she wrote. But at this point, I just had to ask myself, what is my relationship with this content? And the truth is, I just don't want to invite any of these things into our family's life, she continued, even if it comes disguised in beautiful covers, collecting dust on my shelf. I just don't want to to let any of these things in our family's lives. Now, while I was researching this, I found something really, really interesting. I found out that Kat Von D had her first child pretty late in life. She was 36 when she had her first child. Um, and that was just about five years ago, which means when she starts considering throwing out all of her 
occult and witchcraft and all this stuff from her house. She also made a big move from Los Angeles out to Indiana that was finalized this year. Uh, change of place, change of pace. We know that that's a, a, a true psychological reality, can be a true spiritual reality. Uh, was about when her kid would be three, three and a half years old. Walking, talking, asking questions. I don't know this. I just want to say clearly, this is speculation. But having a kid changes things. And she said, I don't want this coming into our family's life. I don't want these things around our family. Kids put new lenses on your life. And it is a very common story for spiritual transformation to begin when people have children and understand the weight of responsibility. Becoming a parent drastically changes how you see the world. Uh, in Luke 12, Jesus said, from everyone who has been given much, much will be demanded. And from the one who has been entrusted with much, much more will be asked. And like the biggest thing that we're ever given and entrusted with is our kids. And here's like a silly example, but it just demonstrates how kids put these new lenses on you. Uh, when you're young and married and you're, you're childless, you'll go to the movies and you'll see a movie and it becomes an, an instant classic between you and your spouse. You know, you just love the movie and you, you quote all the lines and you laugh at it. Your kids become like nine years old and now it's kind of a classic movie and you're like, I can't wait to show this to you. You know, oh, you've got to see Back to the Future, you know, and, and you start showing this to your kids and you're horrified because the way you watch a movie with your kids in the room is a completely different experience. Every little innuendo just kills you a little bit inside. I, I've had experiences where I've gone to show the boys like movies that I liked growing up and 20 minutes in, I turn it off. Like my bad, dude, that should I have shown you the first 20 minutes of this movie? No! Bad idea. It, it's not the same. And if you think that you can navigate your life exactly the same as a, a, a single adult, as you will be able to when you have kids, about the cow. it's just not going to happen. She has this kid who's now climbing around, who's, who's looking at things, who's pulling tarot cards off a shelf, or who's reaching up and grabbing a, a book based in the occult off the shelf. And it makes you begin to question things. And I don't know what else was going on in her life, but sh she said something in her own words that echoes the truth of scripture. Paul wrote to the Ephesians, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, the authorities, and the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. We are in a spiritual battle. And I believe that there has been so much push towards, towards abandoning truth, towards moral relativism, towards embracing forms of spirituality that are counterfeits to the purposes that God created. We've pushed so far in our culture that we're due for a course correction. And my prayer is that Kat Von D, um, with this big change in her life and in her public baptism, that this is a sign of some kind of spiritual renewal in our world. I want to show you a little bit of the video, and I'm going to leave the sound off just for copyright issues. Um, but I, I want to show you, she put this beautiful video of her baptism on Instagram. It's a, a very traditional looking church. You know, she, uh, she knows how to brand like sh she, uh, she knows style. She's an artist. And you can see even just this video of her baptism. It's so artfully done. It's so tastefully done. And you can tell the, these are her people, you know, but they're excited and they're embracing where they are. And when she gets up into the baptismal, it's almost shocking to see her in this just pure white baptism gown because she's always in black. She's always in a gothic style. And it really is a, a beautiful, beautiful video. If you're listening only, uh, the pastor is getting ready. She's in a very traditional baptismal setting. And there it is. There's her baptism. I want to look at what Paul wrote a few chapters later to the Ephesians. Um, the heading on this section is light versus darkness. Let no one deceive you with empty arguments for God's wrath is coming on the disobedient because of these things. Therefore, do not become their partners for you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light for the fruit of light consists of all goodness and righteousness and truth, testing what is pleasing to the Lord. Don't participate in the fruitless works of darkness, but instead expose them for it is shameful even to mention what is done by them in secret. Everything exposed by the light is made visible for what makes 
everything visible is light. Therefore, it is said, get up sleeper and rise up from the dead and Christ will shine on you. I love that it says in verse eight, you were once darkness. It doesn't say you were once in the darkness. You were once darkness and now you are light. That's a statement of identity. I'm not saying she can't dress Gothic. I don't care about that. I have friends who love the Lord, who are light, who dress like that. It's about what's inside of you. It's a statement of identity. It's about understanding your purpose because Jesus told us you are the light of the world. You are a city on a hill. And as Christians, if we truly embrace that, that that's who we're called to be, submitting ourselves to Christ, then we can begin to see a spiritual awakening broadly across our culture, just like we saw in the life of Kat Von D. I want to thank you for tuning in to episode 35. I want to remind you to subscribe to the channel, tell your friends, uh, you know, write a letter, post a review, Put it on your Instagram, uh, share it on Facebook, do all those things. You can follow me online at Clayton Tyner. That's Clayton T-Y-N-E-R. I'm so thankful for you guys. And uh, I hope you'll subscribe. You'll check out some of the other videos and I'll see you next week on episode 36.